it starts at the motherboard. And if the motherboard itself has vulnerabilities, you're gonna have a bad time. Four CVEs in Gigabyte motherboards that allow malware at the UEFI level to bypass Secure Boot. A lot of words going on there. We're gonna break down these four CVEs in the video and talk about why they matter and what you can do about it. To understand this, let's talk about the world of computers, right? Very straightforward stuff. We have our operating system and we have our user mode program like Chrome or Notepad or RuneScape, RuneLite. All these things are user mode programs. And the way this works is the operating system right here supervises the user mode program. It makes sure the user mode program doesn't try to open programs it shouldn't, doesn't try to interact with processes that it shouldn't. But there are multiple layers. This ogre has layers. Beneath the operating system are additional rings. We typically refer to the operating system as ring zero, meaning it's the base of the computer, there is nothing below the operating system. This is actually not true at all. Below their operating system can be another layer, ring negative one called the hypervisor. Let's say for example, you're operating in a cloud computing environment where there are other operating systems on the same hardware. Someone has to make sure that those OSs aren't interacting in a way that would make them malicious. So there is a hypervisor layer. And then even more importantly, below the hypervisor is this thing called SMM or system management mode, which is ring negative two. And it is the ring that your computer turns on in. When your computer initially gets power, SMM is the ring that it starts in and it uses the UEFI, the Universal Extended Framework Interface to power up and load the other layers. Now you will see here that as your system boots up, initially it is in an untrusted state, right? There is a thing called a root of trust that says, hey, initially we trust this firmware, but also we can't touch this firmware, right? The firmware for the UEFI is in an unwritable state. And what's happening here is as the system is booting up, the system management mode layer is checking the signature, the cryptographic hash of the layer above it and saying, hey, does that match a known good? If not, bail out. And this actually happens all the way up to your OS to make sure that there isn't malicious code running. And as this process happens, the trust of your system is going up, but the inherent power that you have is going down, right? As you go up the chain, ultimately, you get to a user mode program that can't make any modifications to the OS. The problem here is that every one of these has a way to talk to the other one. There is an interface to make requests betwixt them, right? So user mode programs can talk to the OS via a system call. If you've ever coded an assembly, I think we do on Mobile Academy, that is a thing that happens here. If you are an OS that knows that you're in a virtualized environment, you can make a hyper call to ask the hypervisor for things. And then the hypervisor can make SMIs, system management interrupts, to ask the motherboard to do things. And like anything guys we talk about on this channel, all things that happen on a computer are code and code can have vulnerabilities. Now these four vulnerabilities are in the SMI handlers on the motherboard. What this means is that they are vulnerabilities in the firmware that runs at the SMM layer, okay? What's happening here is if you are running at ring zero or below, you can trigger a SMI, an SM interrupt, to have the motherboard do something for you. But because of a misimplementation of the SMI, there is a way that an attacker can take control of it. We'll go into the actual nature of these vulnerabilities, but I wanna talk about why this is a bad thing. The SMI vulnerabilities are able to load these things called UEFI level malware or bootkits. If you think of rootkit, a rootkit is a way for a hacker to maintain persistence in your OS, right? You know, they, they maintain root, root is the highest privilege level, so it is a root kit. A boot kit is when they are able to maintain persistence at a level that is below the OS. Meaning, if you install a new OS on this motherboard, the malware is still there. There are common strains of this malware called Black Lotus, Cosmic Strand, Mosaic Aggressor, and others. One that the NSA has actually offered tips on how to get rid of it because of how prolific it was about two years ago. There was a similar vulnerability in the Microsoft Secure Boot process that allowed people with root access to install these malwares into the UEFI. The reason why these are so dangerous, guys, is if there is malware that is running at the SMM level, right? Notice my graph here. This has the least amount of inherent trust and it has the most power, which means that as the hypervisor loads, as the operating system loads, as other programs load on and off disk, right? 
The UEFI malware can make modifications to those pieces of software because it is up to the SMM level to make sure that trust is not violated. But if we have violated the trust of SMM, of the bootloader, all bets are off. The computer is completely fried. Now, how does this happen? How is it possible to violate the integrity of SMM, okay? Well, like we said before, there are interfaces that we want to be able to use to interact with the motherboard itself. And ultimately those interfaces are just code, right? By the way, guys, this world of exploitation or software security interests you at all, check out the link in the description below. We're starting something really cool where you can learn to hack and secure software. Go check it out. This is the code, the pseudo code that runs inside of the motherboard, right? This is the code that we from the OS, again, consider our graph here, our OS are able to make a request to the SMM. What's happening here is we are putting in two registers, RBX and RCX. Think of those as like hyper fast memory inside the CPU that we're able to control as we do the SMI, right? The SMI interrupt, the system management interrupt. What's happening here is we can ask it to run this command RCX0 command. Now, what's crazy is that the, the code that runs this command, basically all it does is it goes to the location that you put into the RBX register, which again is any arbitrary memory address. And then if as long as the signature, meaning the four bytes that are at that location is some known good value, it gives you control of those bytes. Again, if you've ever coded anything in your life, you should hear what I'm saying. Attacker controlled memory address, it does a four byte check on that memory address, and if it's valid, you get to control it. And when I say control it, I mean you can write to the memory in SM RAM, right? But the problem is it's any of the memory. The system management RAM, which exists at this extremely trusted level, can now be arbitrarily controlled by the OS. Why this is so crazy, guys, is there is so much work put in by motherboard manufacturers to make sure that this chain of code execution, this secure boot process going from this, this literally the SPI flash on the motherboard up to the OS contains a chain of trust where an original root trust authority verifies that other pieces of data are verified up until user mode execution, right? The problem here is now basically the motherboard's like, oh yeah, wait, you know how to control four bytes? Like you can put four bytes in the code? Yeah, you can write whatever you want there, we don't care. And now the attacker can just put whatever data they want in that location. It's that, like, that is absolutely nuts to me. And ultimately, right, right, what happens is the malware that gets in there, the code that the user is able to write into RAM is able to do things like read flash, erase flash, and write flash, and able to use that functionality to install code that now runs on the motherboard at boot, completely violating this entire trust process. I wanna give Gigabyte a little bit of credit. Like this is actually a vulnerability, not directly in um, the code itself by Gigabyte. There is another company called AMI that actually writes the firmware. So AMI wrote the firmware and a vulnerability did get put out that AMI did broadcast to all the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers. And I guess Gigabyte unfortunately decided just like to not patch it. And here we are right with this giant vulnerability, but it's just, it's crazy guys. Like in, so in terms of remediation, right? Like how do we remediate these things? In my opinion, if you ever think you're susceptible, if you ever think you've been compromised by a piece of malware like Black Lotus, right? Which again, the NSA has put out guidance on how to get rid of it. If that ever happens, throw out your motherboard. In my opinion, they are able to get such a low level. That's the name of the channel, by the way to such a low level in your CPU that like, you're just never gonna recover from that. If you told me, hey, this motherboard has had a bootkit in it at one time, but we don't know if it's still there. Can you test it for me? I'd say, no, throw it out. It's literally garbage. One important note, right? For this execution to happen, for someone to be able to exploit your motherboard, they first need to get code execution as user mode, like they exploit maybe your browser, your email, your PDF view or whatever. And then they have to then exploit into your operating system to get into ring zero from where they can then make the SMI requests, right? So there are multiple layers here. Ogres have layers. So there are places that you can put antivirus to check for Black Lotus as it's going up the chain to look for maybe the signature of Black Lotus as it's about to get installed. The problem is once this has been installed at the SMM level, you have violated the entire chain of trust of software and can therefore inherently no longer trust your antivirus, right? Your antivirus could be getting lied to about what data it is fed from your RAM or even worse, 
like the antivirus itself could have been modified on the way up. And there's no way for you to see that once this level has been compromised. Would Rust have fixed this? Dun, 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 dun. So technically, 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 the answer is yes, right? All of these are memory corruption vulnerabilities that a memory safe language like Rust would have fixed. However, there are many caveats to that. To write Rust code that lives in an embedded environment, which a motherboard at the end of the day, when it starts, is an embedded environment, right? To write code that lives in an embedded environment, it has to run in this mode in Rust called no standard and this mode called no main. Basically, you have no access to any of the core utilities in Rust. You have to write a lot of them yourself. And also the inherent nature of embedded devices are global mutability, right? You have random hard-coded address that when I write to it, magical things happen. And global mutability, while it is the fundamental principle of embedded programming, is also the antithesis of Rust development. So inherently, you have to use unsafe Rust, which if this were to be done in Rust, I guarantee you there'd be unsafe Rust in there. And there, at that point, you're kind of like, you know, defeating the purpose, right? So would Rust have fixed this? I'll give it a high five, like a 5.9 out of 10, but like not, not confident that'd be super useful. Anyway, guys, if you like this stuff, do me a favor, hit that like, hit subscribe if you're new here, and then go check this video out, but a similar bug that I think you will find equally as interesting. We'll see you there. Goodbye.